I said I was sorry, Jen. Jamie, repeat after me. Newfoundland, Nunavut. Hear the difference? There's a similarity, you gotta admit it. Newfoundland, Newfoundland. Okay, let me see. Um, one is at Canada's far east, and the other one's at Canada's far north. Hmm. You know, I really don't see the similarity. Okay, I'm sorry, I bought the wrong map. So now what are we gonna do? We're totally lost. Don't worry, I've got the as the crow flies compass working on my geocam. We are going to be in Rankin Inlet in no time. Well, until that happens, I am going to flake out under this giant Inukshuk. Inukshuk? That's it! We're saved! These things have been used for centuries as markers, Jen. So Rankin Inlet must be right around here somewhere. So it's pointing this way! I guess that's why they say it's not polite to point. Woo! Okay, wait up for me. In this episode of CG Kids, we discover the past and present in Rankin Inlet, Nunavut. We get a crash course in Inuktitut with 13-year-old Candace Kusagak. Then we explore the life and death struggle for the ancient Inuit 3,000 years ago. And we get to try our hand at a new yet old art form. In Jay's geology, I see why the North Pole attracts our compasses. Old ways, new ways, and even Eldon's way, all on this episode of CG Kids. <laughs> <laughs> my point. Smell it. Rankin Inlet, the second largest community in Canada's newest territory of Nunavut. There are more than 40,000 Inuit living in Canada and more than half call Nunavut home. Although to the Inuit people, Nunavut is known as our land. For a hamlet of 2,100 people, Rankin Inlet has quite a reputation for a few things. Minerals such as gold and nickel have been mined all around the area. It also has tons of artists for a community of this size, and it is also the government and transportation hub of the Central Arctic. Now its reputation also includes its weather, because it can be pretty wickedly cold up here. Oh, come on, it's not that bad. What? Okay, you're right, let's get warm. By southern standards, Rankin Inlet may be a small community, but for the north, it's a pretty big place. In fact, Rankin Inlet is the largest city in the Kivalik region of Nunavut. Nunavut is a vast territory covering 1.9 million square kilometers and is broken up into three official regions. Kivalik is basically the south and central part of this massive territory. Rankin Inlet sits in the center of the region on the northwestern side of the massive Hudson Bay. When you look at a map of Canada, the first thing you notice is Hudson Bay. It's 830 kilometers wide. More incredibly, the bay is 1,500 kilometers long, and most of it is in Nunavut. Even these islands along here are part of Nunavut. Hudson Bay is basically frozen for eight months of the year, so it doesn't warm up the surrounding land. As a result, it can be a very cold, windy place. Rankin Inlet is located right here on the bay's coast. It's also known as Kangiktinik in the Ignuktiktuk language, which means deep bay or inlet. Hudson Bay is actually an inland sea that is joined to both the Arctic and the Atlantic Oceans. But who knows how long Canada's huge bay may last. The basin is actually rising at a rate of 60 centimeters per century. This means that Hudson Bay could completely disappear in about 4 million years. Until then, Jennifer and Jamie should try to keep warm. Yes, we are at Mani Uluyuk Ayanavik Middle School, and we're meeting up with 13-year-old Candice Kuzovok. And uh, where is she? 
I don't know. I thought you were supposed to figure out where she was going to be. I thought you were doing all the planning. Okay, well, hi, I'm Jamie. Jamie. Hi, Jennifer. I'm oh. Candace. Oh! Hi! <laughs> How did you know it was us? You guys are the only ones wearing your hats and mitts inside, so you guys, I guess you guys are from the South. <laughs> I guess you're pretty obvious. Maybe we could take it off and uh, you could show us around? Yes. Come on. Thank you. You must look pretty silly, huh? <laughs> You know what? Like, I really find that this school looks like almost every other school you would find in Canada. Yeah, but the only different thing, I think, is that we learn you know, students instead in classes instead of French. So instead of having French classes in school, you actually have Inuktitut classes? Oh, yes. Wow. Is that what those letters are above those pictures there? Are those yes. Inuktitut letters? Who do you know here? Anybody? I know my dad here, and these are his brothers and sisters. And then down here is my grandmother. Aww. And then right here is my mom's mom. We notice that all over the school, there are charts that translate common English words into Inuktitut. Candace has spoken this language all of her life and only started to learn English around the age of nine. Do all the kids in the school speak Inuktitut as well as you do? Some of them will, but some of them aren't really into it. So, some so they have aren't these into to it. help? Yes. Okay, um, let me try one. <clears throat> What's wrong? Suvit? Yeah. I said it right? Yes. I don't understand. Yes. <gasps> wow, we're good at this. I love it. It's such a, it's got lots of nice click sounds. Go. Go. And there's baby words there too. I like the baby words. Kaka. Oh, okay. <laughs> what, is that? what does that mean? Monster. <laughs> Monster. How There's the caca. Okay, we can actually carry on a conversation, Jamie. Ready? Suvit. <clears throat> Sumitunga. Do you know what we just said? Yeah. And I'll tell you what I have to say about that. Uh, look, guys. Tuki si hook. Okay? Didn't you just say that's okay? I have care of his skin boots. <laughs> Candace introduced us to some of her friends during the lunch hour. So guys, you must hear a lot of, of like misconceptions, like kids from the South thinking you all live in igloos. Like what's some of the weird stuff you've heard? We don't live in igloos. We don't eat raw meat. We sometimes do, but not raw, just frozen. Well, aren't you all going back to your igloos after class today? No. no. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry, you don't come to school by dog sled? No. <laughs> Do you guys ever listen to music or is it all just throat singing and stuff? We listen music. to music. Like what kind of music? Throat singing rap, music? Rap, rap, anything. So you actually rap in Inuktitut? Yes. Can you do some rapping for us right now? Sure. All right. Nalanga. Nalanga. Bingwata. Bingwata. Oh, how's the wood? Oh, how's the wood? Inuktitut. Inuktitut. Candice recorded this rap for a CD co-produced by kids and elders in the area. The song describes how contact between the Inuit and Southerners can be a good thing as we can learn from each other. That was great! You are a rapper extraordinaire. <laughs> money, money, give me your money. Do you hear that? What's the okay, you got some sale? money for me? Give me some money. Elton, what are you doing here? Come on, yeah, that's, that's good. What are you raising money for? I think that this town needs an Inukshuk. Rankinana already has an Inukshuk. Yes, but this one is going to be made of chocolate. <laughs> chocolate? Yeah! Yeah, let me show you. I got something in my pocket here. Okay. Oh. There you go. But there's only one piece. You wouldn't believe how expensive that chocolate bar was. Well, everything is expensive up here. Because it has to be shipped from the south. That's why it's so expensive. Oh, well, no kidding. And that's why I gotta raise money, okay? So give me your change. Hey, hey. No, 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 no. Don't touch that. Leave it alone, leave it alone, you bad, bad kids. This is Canada's biggest bay, and this is Canada's biggest triviography question. Okay, don't you think you're overdoing it just a little bit, Jamie? Well, that was a hint to the answer. 
Okay, I'll bite. Go ahead. Bite. That's what I just said. And that's also the question. Oh! <laughs> Today's triviography question is, what is a bite? Bite? And it's not something your dog does. And it's not something you find in a computer either. So just chew on that question for a while and Jay will be back with the answer. When most people think of art produced by the Inuit people, they think of soapstone carvings like this one. The fact is, soapstone carving has only been a part of Inuit culture for maybe 50 years. Now, of course, the, the northern people have been making artistic creations for thousands and thousands of years. Masks, sculptures, petroglyphs carved into rock tell us a lot about the Inuit people and their close relationship with the natural world. Here in Rankin, in a, a new artistic tradition is being created. The people of Rankin are expressing themselves in ceramics. Oh. The Matchbox Gallery features artwork from local artists in Rankin Inlet. These creations reflect the life, history, and mythology of the Inuit. They include paintings, traditional carvings, and especially ceramics. Oh, Jim, this stuff is amazing! Mm. Wow! Yeah, mm. this, this represents uh, works by most of the people. Uh, that um, have been working with us since the beginning. A lot of this ceramic work deals with stories or deals with images that come from nature or that come from life. It's not abstract. There is kind of an implied story to a lot of this work. Clay in its initial stages is such an easy medium to work with. You can manipulate it very easily. Clay is just earth and water, which is the first materials that human beings encounter and run into. If you combine these two elements, there's something very soothing and pleasing to human beings about working with these, these two basic, essential materials that are everywhere. A substance from the earth creating stories yes. about the people that live there. Yes, excellent, that's right. This is Pierre Alpelarjuk. He's been with us since the beginning of our program. He is a skilled ceramist. So Pierre, where do you get your inspiration? Um, I, I, I get it from from, from my idea, from my mind, and from what I see when I'm out in the land, and the stories from the elders. That's amazing. This is so neat to work with. I love the feel of this. Have you always been a sculptor? Uh, yes. I started out with soapstone and then with clay. Which do you prefer, soapstone or working with clay? I like clay a little bit better, because when it's too small, you can add it. When it's too big, you can make it smaller. I like this clay better. I'm making a whale. <laughs> Want to see what I made? Because I'm trying to use your inspiration, how you create things from your culture and your life. This is my dog, Petunia. Yay! <laughs> she kind of looks like a little pig right now. In real life, she doesn't look like a pig. I think it looks exactly like Petunia. Thank you so much, Pierre. Thank you. I hope Jim will want these for his gallery. Do you remember the triviography question? Okay, we'll give you a hint. Ready? <coughs> what is a bite of you, Jay? What is a bite? That's a good question. And the answer is staring you in the face if you're looking at an image of Canada. A bite is the type of bay that is formed by an indentation on a coastline. While most bays like Georgian Bay are set off from the main body of water, bites are part of the larger body. Bites are commonly found between two bits of land jutting out and kind of look like a bite has been taken out of the land. There's a really interesting one that's part of Hudson Bay. Just north of James Bay, you can see a very smooth curved bite. While it hasn't been proven, some scientists believe that this bite was created when a massive meteor crashed into Earth four billion years ago. Sounds like the meteor took a bite out of Hudson Bay. We are standing on an esker here in Italic Territorial Park. 
which is about 10 kilometers northwest of Rankin Inlet. And this park is full of artifacts dating back over 3,000 years. The Inuit and their ancestors have lived here for all those thousands of years. The name Yurlik comes from an Inuit legend, and a Yurlik is someone who turns into a spirit that whistles. Their lives remained unchanged for centuries until the Europeans came to the north to explore. Then everything changed. We're going to meet up with Teresi Tungalik, and she's an artist who has lived on the shores of Hudson Bay her entire life. Yeah. How Hello. are you? What is this particular section we're standing around right now? Right in this section we have at least three tent rings uh, that identify that the tents have been standing here before because the rocks were used for anchoring the tent down. These rock circles are all that's left from a 1,400-year-old campsite. They show where the round base of the tent was. It's believed that thousands of years ago, Hudson Bay's water was higher, so the shoreline was actually where we're standing. Now, why did you choose to put your camp here? <laughs> what was here? The river would provide a lot of fish. And also, this is the main area where the caribou crossing was. So to live, you had to follow the animals to make sure your children didn't go hungry and to make sure that they had warm, good clothing. And because the animals were our only source of survival. So thousands of years ago, there was a river here and your ancestors were basically living off the land. Everything's changed now. Like, how, how do you think that's changed your heritage, your culture? Everything that they used, their homes, their hunting equipment, their kayaks, everything was made out of natural material. We had a lot to do with respecting the land and living off the land and with great respect to the land itself alone because, because it was our only means of living. Many of these things are coming back now because once we have claimed our own territory, we are feeling like ourselves once more. We, we are glad to be here. We are glad to be progressing again, again in our own way. On the surface, the park appears to be nothing more than one pile of rocks after another. But you have to search and look beyond the rocks. So what is this particular area? This area is where uh, people have been buried. It's a grave site. And actually, there's a skull in there that, to prove that this is a grave. Oh, really? Yes. Can we go look at that? Let's take a look a at skull. it. skull. We're inside here. Was this like an official grave site where there people buried in? <gasps> yes, oh, it's right here. Wow, that is, it's a, it's a real skull. There's a skull in there. So is this, I mean, was there particular spots where people were buried, like graveyards? Well, long ago when Inuit were nomadic, um, when a member of the family passed away, they buried them where they died unless they had specific requests to be buried in a certain place. Well, Teresa, I have to say that you do an incredible job with sharing your heritage and your ancestors' history with us because this was just amazing. Thank you so much. Oh, yes. you're Thank welcome. You. Thank you. Let's too. go find some. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Let's just stay like this for a little bit longer. Yeah. I'm using a compass and a map to help me find my way around this park. I'm actually looking for a building within the park. My map was used for orienteering. So what I have to do is rotate my compass so that the orienting arrow points north on the map. Then I rotate both of them so that my compass needle points north. So that means I go that way. There, I found the building I was looking for. The really cool thing is that no matter where I stand on the earth, this little compass will always point towards the North Pole. So why is that? Because my compass has a very small lightweight magnet balancing on this pivot point. The Earth also has magnetism created by its molten metal core constantly circulating and sending out a system of electric currents. But the magnet inside the Earth is actually upside down with the South at the North. So the North magnet of my compass is attracted to the Earth's North Pole. 
but there are actually two North Poles, the Geographic North Pole and the Magnetic North Pole, and they're not even in the same place. Let's check it out. We know that Jennifer and Jamie are pretty far north in Nunavut. We know this because they are a lot colder than most of us are right now. Also because we can look at the lines of latitude and longitude on a map or a globe. These lines of latitude and longitude divide the Earth into chunks, which have coordinates, so that you can tell exactly where you are on the planet. The longitude lines start and end at the North and South Poles. Here's Rankin Inlet, and it's almost another 4,000 kilometers to go before reaching the geographic North Pole. But we now know that the Earth is like a giant magnet, and just like the Earth, every magnet has both a North and South Pole. Like the old saying goes, opposites attract. So the North Pole of my magnet is attracted to the South Pole, and the South Pole to the North Pole. But if I try to push these two North Pole magnets together, they just won't stick. So let's think of my paper plate as being the Earth, with the North Pole and the South Pole, and the space in between is a magnetic field. I'm going to put some metal objects onto my plate. When I put a magnet under this plate, you can see how all my stuff is attracted to the magnetic force and lines up along the field lines. This is what happens with a compass. So let's test the Earth's magnetic field line by making our own compass. I'm going to magnetize this pin by rubbing it a few times against this magnet. Now watch what happens when I float the pin on this water. The pin is lining up with the Earth's magnetic field line. Let's compare it with my compass. It's the same. So where is the Earth's magnetic north? Well, it's actually moving about 10 to 15 kilometers a year. Here's the geographic north pole. And over here, about 966 kilometers south in Nunavut, is currently where the magnetic north pole can be found. So who knows, in 50 years, I might think I'm heading magnetically north to Nunavut, and end up in Russia. And I thought Jennifer and Jamie got lost a lot. At least they're always in Canada. A fantastic fact about Nunavut is that one of its islands, Devon Island, is used as a test site for future explorations on the planet Mars. Since its barren terrain resembles the surface of Mars, every summer, men and women of the Canadian Space Agency and the Mars Society set up space camp at the Houghton Crater on the island. I guess if you can survive in northern Nunavut, you can survive anywhere. Oh, wow! Now we know which way we're going. Jen, you know what? The Inukshuk has always been a welcome sight for Canada's northern travelers. It says, I have been here already. You are on the right path. You know what we should do? We should forge our own path. We should explore new lands. Okay, so we just came from that direction, so we should go in that direction. No, I think we came from that direction. Jamie, we just came from over there. We're gonna go... Do you smell something really good? Yeah, it smells kind of chocolatey. Yes! My chocolate chuck says you are on the right path. Hey, thanks, Eldon. See, I told you it was that way. Thanks, Eldon. No problem. This is a song for everybody. I need big bucks for my chuckalock shack. Big bucks for my chuckalock shack. So send in your money, cause I'm your honey. I'm Eldon. I like it well done. I need chuckalock big bucks. Oh, Candice, you are so much better than that. That's just bad. Good luck getting money for that, Eldon. Don't worry, I'm, I have confidence in myself. I just have to write it. Bucks for my chuckalock shack. Bucks for my chuckalock shack.